all right. We are alive. Cool. Okay, we got some people dropping in. Thank you for joining. Christine, you've already been added as a uh, uh, moderator. So thank you, appreciate you joining. Howdy. Look, I'm terrible with names, so please don't be offended if I miss your name. I apologize. <laughs> I'm really bad. That's good old brain damage from the Navy. You gotta love it. Okay, we got a lot to cover tonight, uh, and I'm hoping some more people come in. Um, uh, Bill, good to meet you, brother. I'm, I'm JJ or Joaquin. Um, we got a lot to cover tonight. Um, and the number one thing before we get into the skew chisel, I really need to talk about safety. I saw one of the scariest things I've ever seen on a video on, you, on TikTok earlier this afternoon. That was uh, uh, Munchy Chi woodworking wood turning i'm messing it up anyway um they were trying to hollow out the end of a uh little cup in a spindle orientation and they were using the most dangerous tool they possibly could so we're going to talk a little bit about the structure of wood how to hey mrs p thanks for joining me um we're going to talk a little bit about the structure of wood we're going to talk about the right tools to use for which direction the wood is, what the structure is shaped like, okay? Because what I saw today could have very caused a lot of harm to the person, the wood turner, who was doing it. Um, thankfully, they were receptive to me saying, hey, whoa, 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 don't do that. That's dangerous. And uh, they uh, have been messaging with me, and we talked about it, and we talked about safety. So we're, we're going to do that real quick. For, so in order to understand why it's a big deal, first we got to talk about the way wood is structured. So I'm going to use this little stack of uh, glue sticks. Although it's close, but it's not very accurate because wood is actually hollow tubes or straws or tubules. Um, but a good representation is this is a grain of wood, and when you put it all together... This is the grain of wood. When you cut a uh, spindle orientation, you're holding the wood this way. So the grain is running laterally from left to right, top to bottom, front to back, uh, uh, left to right. Okay. When you're turning in spindle orientation, when you're turning a bowl, you're turning across the grain. Now this is important because it has directly to do with safety and with using the correct tools. So the first thing we need to understand is when you look at this piece of wood, which is cut as a spindle, this is the end grain. This is the side grain. And you can see our little tubes are going from left to right, just like the, the bundle of glue sticks. Our tubules, our grain pattern, our structure is going from left to right. Okay, hey Chris. So um, that's important when we talk about how we are cutting this wood. Let me get the glue sticks out of here. Now I know this seems like it's really basic and a lot of you use saws all the time and you know about this, but when we're talking about adding knives to it, we're adding an element that's very dangerous. So what we're talking about before we get into the skew chisel is safety and safely addressing the direction of the grain. Um, with the correct tool. Uh, so, um, sorry. <laughs> okay, there are a lot of different tools, but I'm going to talk about some of the very basics and what the tool was that I saw the person trying to hollow end grain, trying to go into end grain with. This is marketed. Um, this is marketed by Savannah, and I think Hurricane too, as a bowl gouge. And it sort of, it, it is sort of a bowl gouge, but it's also structured much like a shorter version of a spindle roughing gouge. And that's important because what you have across here, across the top, is almost a straight line with these little sharp corners. So when you try to take this into the end grain, 
into the end grain of a piece of wood, you have a very, very shallow path before you hit that corner and you get a serious kickback. You get a serious uh, um, gouge in the, in the wood and you get a kickback, okay? Now, experience wood turners will tell you never, Manchi, Manchichi wood turning, there you are, good to see you. Experienced wood turners will tell you never, ever, ever turn a bowl or hollow with a spindle roughing gouge. Okay, this is the typical spindle roughing gouge. And one of the reasons they tell you not to do this is because see this little very narrow piece of metal right here? It's only that thick. Whereas with a bowl gouge, look at the difference. This is a 5 8 inch bowl gouge. That is a 5 8 inch shaft that goes into the tool. All the torsion and flexion is absorbed uh, with that heavy chunk of steel. Whereas here, if you're trying to hollow, you've got a much smaller piece of steel. So if you get that, yeah, the shank cannot take the pressure. You get that steel in there, it'll start bending and this will snap and it will fly and it will hurt. If it doesn't hurt you, if there's somebody else in the uh, in the shop, it could hurt them. This is the, this is not the tool to use to hollow any kind of a bowl shape. Don't do it. Don't do it. It is dangerous. Um, now I don't have the right type. There is a type of spindle gouge that you can use to hollow. It is designed like a shallow bowl gouge. So we're going to talk about it real quick. So I just showed you the spindle roughing gouge. When you look at it dead on, it, it, you'll have to excuse my visual aids. When you look at it dead on, it looks like a U with a flat face. That face is sharpened to 45 degrees, okay? That face is sharpened to 45 degrees. From the side, my awful drawing, you see how it's just a straight cross, okay? That is a spindle roughing gouge. The reason I say that although this is marketed as a spindle gouge, it is basically just a dumbed down, narrower version of the spindle roughing gouges. Look at the design. It's almost identical. It's a little bit shorter and the wings are cut back a tiny bit, but not enough to hollow with. Not enough to hollow with. So spindle roughing gouge is used solely in the spindle orientation just the spindle orientation when you are cutting the grain oriented long ways if you are cutting a bowl or if you are trying to hollow don't use this tool use a bowl gouge a round nose scraper is a safe tool to use to hollow if you don't have a bowl gouge this is a safe tool to use Spindle gouges that look are built more like bowl gouges have a profile more like this. They look a lot like a fingernail bowl gouge. The difference being you see how that's a, par a parabola? How it's a deep U? The spindle gouge is a very shallow U. You can hollow with this type of spindle gouge. It looks a lot more like this gouge, but this is a bowl gouge. It's got a deep U. The spindle gouge is shallower, but it looks a lot like this gouge. It usually has a fingernail type grind or a traditional grind, which is a very sharp little crescent. Whereas most bowl gouge turners are now using things like the 4040, which is wide and gets you sharpness on the wings. The spindle gouge is, is very narrow down there and, and brings down close in order to actually do what, what they were trying to do with this gouge, which is not shaped correctly to be safe. So that's an actual spindle gouge. I don't own any, own any yet. I, I don't own any yet. I need to get some. Um, these are uh, 
not inexpensive. But if you do a lot of spindle turning, they're absolutely worth the, worth the investment. So there are two different types of bowl gouges. This is a parabolic or deep V. And then there's a rounder um, uh, groove. Okay, but it's still a bowl gouge. You're still going halfway through the circle. Whereas your spindle gouge is, is, two, is a third, it's less, it's a third, a third or so, okay? Where your, uh, your bowl gouge is going to go 50% of the circle, okay? Um, and then we're not going to get into grinds or anything, but just it's important to understand the differences. If you're going to order a spindle gouge, if it's got a shank like that, it's not what you're looking for. Look for the spindle gouge that has the fully round shank that goes into the tool, into the, into the body, the handle. This is going to be the correct gouge to do those kinds of operations. Now, I am not an expert, but I'm going to tell you some names. Go to YouTube and just search spindle gouge or spindle turning or skew turning. You're going to see some names. Mike Walt, W-A-L-D-T. He's a British turner. He's been doing it for a long, long time. And he does some very, very good uh, tutorials and explanations on spindle turning and spindle gouges, skews, and the like. Another good one is Worth the Effort. Um, he's a woodworker in Texas who, who actually ran a woodworking school. He has a couple of videos that are actually classes specifically about the skew chisel, spindle gouges, bowl gouges. Look up Captain Eddie Castellan, uh, Big Guy Productions. Captain Eddie has been doing this for 40 years at least. Captain Eddie is a great resource. You gotta go back in his videos and they go back to grainy. It was originally filmed on VHS. That's how old his videos are. But there is some gold mine. Go look up the experts. Sam Angelo, the uh, uh, that's all I've got. My best turning tools are the Sorby. This is my best turning tool, and that's a Robert Sorby. The rest are Hurricane or Savannah because that's what I could afford. I'm collecting Sorby. Thompson turning tools are very, very good, and their customer service is outstanding. Um, Carter and Sons are very, very good. It depends on what you like. Whatever brand you buy, it de that depends on what you like. Sorby happens to be the first top name turning tool that I bought and I'm impressed. This is good steel. It's strong. It stays sharp. Um, so as I replace my starter set of turning tools, my Hurricanes and my Savannas, I'm going to Sorby's. There's nothing wrong with the less expensive tools. However, this is my 5 8 inch roughing gouge that I turned into a or, uh, 5 8 inch bowl gouge that I turned into a uh, fingernail gouge from Hurricane. It was longer than the Sorby. The steel is not as hard as the Sorby. The Sorby is also the parabolic, whereas the Hurricane is not as parabolic. It's still parabolic, but it's not a deep V like the Sorby. So the Sorby is going to be the one that I'm going to change to a... Um, <clears throat> swept back uh, swept back grind like this you can just see the wings which is because it's a better steel and it's got a deeper V this is a shallow this is also hurricane this is a shallow uh, U so it didn't work the swept back grind didn't work very good um, but yeah, Sorby, Sor uh, I, I'm not going to say anything bad about any of those brands. Sorby's the one I've started with. And if you look, like if you go check out Sam Angelo, the Wyoming wood turner on uh, uh, YouTube, he's got Thompson's, Carter's, Sorby's. He's got little known brand uh, uh, stuff from, from different brands. Um, you know, uh, find the tools that work for you. Now I use high speed steel. I do not use uh, the cryo steel simply because I have to have a completely different um, set of sharpening stuff for cryo steel. You can only use the 
CBN wheels and slow turn grinders. And, and you know what? I'm really happy with my Sorby system for sharpening. So safety. You do not hollow with any tool with this skinny little joint into the handle. If it doesn't have a solid uh, rod of steel, don't hollow with it. Please, for your own safety, do not hollow with it. But that's not what we're here to talk about tonight. That's just a dangerous thing I saw and I wanted to address and make sure that we got the word out there that I want you all to learn wood turning, turning. I want you to love wood turning and I want you to know how to do it safely. And that's not safe. Let's talk about the skew. Everybody hates the skew. I don't want to use the skew. If you've ever watched Jimmy Clues, which, who is a world-class bowl turner, uh, started out at 14 years old in his father's shop in um, Liverpool, I think, in England, at 14, turning... Uh, yeah, don't overextend over the rest. Yes, absolutely. You need to keep your rest as close to your work surface as safely as possible. Um, anyway, Jimmy Clues goes to work turning uh, turning um, uh, banister railings or banister uh, stair rail supports and chair legs and stuff for his dad, his dad's shop in England. And his dad hands him a skew and goes, make beads and groups, beads and, uh, beads and coats, beads and coats, beads and coats, beads and coats. Okay. And the first thing Jimmy Clue said is, I'm going to do this, but I'm going to figure out how to do this without using that doggone skew. And although he's very, very good with the skew chisel, he absolutely abhors it. And he's developed, he's one of the people who helped develop the 4040 grind, um, which you can use on spindle turnings and it works very, very well. <clears throat> now, the best breakdown I've seen of this is from Worth the Effort on YouTube. But I'm going to try to. I'm going to try to mimic his explanation. The skew chisel is the same as a wood plane. It's just shaped a little differently. Okay? This is the exact same tool that does the exact same action as this. It's just how it's addressed to the wood that is different. So you've got the blade, you've got the heel, you've got the toe, and you've got the plane, okay? Blade, heel, toe, and plane. Blade, heel, toe, plane. Okay, get that? Blade, heel, Toe, plane, same tool, different shape, same effect, different shape. What makes people hate this is when you've got this in your hand and you're planing, right? You've got this huge plane that holds back and, and, and you, it's not pushing back at you, right? It jams and you back up and you hit it again, you back up and you hit it again, right? Well, with the lathe, the wood's moving, not the tool. And if it catches, it kicks the tool back at you. But you're trying to work forward. So you push it back in. And this is where the scary part with the catches, with the skew come. So we're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about some ways to mitigate the catching. Unless you are using it on the tool rest, level so it's sitting level on the tool rest and you are using it as a scraper or in this case a negative rake scraper there's a standard or bull nose scraper straight line into the wood negative rake means that this angle is going down from the wood okay so on a bull on cross grade turning you can use this as a negative rake scraper the moment you drop the handle and start pointing the blade up on a bowl, you're done. You will get a catch, it'll gouge into the wood, it can fling the tool back at you. The only time you can use this on a bowl is as a negative rake scraper, or you can use the tip, the long edge, the toe, you can use the tip to do accents. 
as a very sharp point tool, okay? As a very sharp point tool. But you cannot plane and do some of the things that I'm going to show you with the skew on this piece of wood on a bolt. It will, it will not work. It will catch. It will throw the tool back at you. This is primarily 99.99% of the time used for spindle turning. And I'm, I'm emphasizing that for the reason of safety, because if you don't do it, if you try to use it on a bowl, you can get hurt very badly. Okay? It's not, it, it, and, and that's the only reason I'm emphasizing the way I am, is because I don't want people to get hurt. Wood turning, I know wood turners, furniture builders, guys who are doing it professionally and make a lot of money, and I say I would turn on a lathe, and they go, I won't use a lathe, it's too dangerous. And these are guys that have got planers and, and uh, um, uh, drill presses and table saws and routers and all this stuff, right? And they say, I won't go near the lathe. Okay? And the reason that the lathe has such a bad experience is this, or a bad uh, reputation is the skew. So we're going we're gonna to try to do a little bit to demystify the skew. In fact, I think Worth the Efforts video about skew chisels is called Demystifying the Skew. And I really, really highly recommend you take, I think it's an hour long, it's worth sitting down with your coffee and watching Worth the Efforts lesson on skew chisels. Absolutely invaluable information. He teaches it as basically at a high school level, um, which is okay because he, he's a teacher and um, and he talks he talks about safety he talks about how the tool is used he, he goes through the parts of the tool different methods and he's excellent but I want to talk about some basics um, and just kind of get you less scared of this the skew hopefully we'll have a couple uh, catches I want you to see the catches because I want you to see how I handle them I'm not embarrassed when I get a catch I was watching uh, another British turner today using a skew, skew chisel, and he got a catch, and he goes, well, that's the first time I've ever had a catch on camera. This guy's been doing it for 20 years on camera. And <clears throat> he said, that's the first time I've ever allowed a catch to be shown on camera. Well, that's wrong. If we want to teach people about the craft, then they need to see the bad stuff with the good stuff. One thing I like about Sam Angelo is he's got three fingers missing on one hand, and he'll tell you, you know, somebody somebody messaged him and said, "What's the what's the the best tool or you know the, the 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 best saw to get?" And Sam said, "Saw stop." Okay, uh, you know the guy that's missing the fingers is the one who's going to give you the skinny on the safety because he, he learned the hard way. So give me a second. I'm going to lower the camera so that you can see and you can see Mr. Wigglesworth. I'm actually using the ring light tonight. Oh my God. It has a better tripod. Okay. Uh, I got to move you around a little so you can see what's going on. Excuse my shop. It is literally half of a storage shed and it's a mess. But hopefully things get better soon. Okay, yeah, you can't see the inside of the wood. You can't see the weird stuff. I got a piece of walnut here that's gorgeous. This is spindle orientation. That is not literally and figuratively. And when I put this on the lathe, you're going to see a catch. There is no way not to get a catch right here. I don't think, I mean, well, maybe there is. Maybe we can not get a catch. We'll see. All right, so this is a piece of cherry. Um, very nice tight grain cherry. It has been dried in a kiln. It's extremely dry, close grain. So this is really good word, wood to turn spindle. Um, and in fact, I'm going to show you later, this is apple, also very good. And we're going to do a finial and we're just going to use a skew to do it. And you all are going to think I'm crazy until it comes out right. So first pro tip for beginners when you're using a skew, every other time you turn, you're going to be told the tool rest needs to be level with the center of the workpiece. 
If you want to reduce the chance of a catch with a skew, raise your tool rest up a little bit, okay? If you want to, hey, good to see you, Stout Creations. Good to see you. We're here for you tonight, too. If you want to reduce the opportunity for a catch, um, raise your tool rest a little bit higher, about a quarter of an inch higher than uh, you do for a, a bowl gouge, for a gouge, okay? And the reason for that is because it allows you to rest your cut on top on top of the piece of the work piece so I actually have to raise it a little more because this thing's so big this is two two by two you, it allows you to rest on top of the work piece and work very gently okay so this is square take that off there so it, don't, it won't fly at me this is square so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start rounding it but instead of the spindle roughing gouge we're gonna use a skew now, you should use the skew. Pen turners will tell you, run your lathe as fast as you can. A lot of them use skews, skews to turn pens. Um, yes, if, for a gouge, your tool rest should be where the point of the tool is at the middle, at the dead center of the workpiece. So the dead center of your drive center, dead center of your, of your life center. Spindle turning with a skew, you can raise it up a little bit. Okay? Spindle turning with a skew, you can raise it up a bit. It reduces your chance of catching. Also, use the heel of the gouge for planing cuts. Okay? Use the heel of the gouge for beads. Um, use the toe of the gouge or the long end of the gouge, okay, for slices and squaring off and the insides of coats but let's make it round first so i'm spinning at 1800 rpm do not try to come in off the end you'll hurt yourself come in around the middle set the chisel on the tool rest first tool rest first gently lower it and raise the toe up so that the heel is what addresses the wood at roughly a 45 degree angle. Don't get too deep, it's okay to back off. Don't try to come from the end in, it doesn't work. I think I have a little knot there. That's where I'm getting that catch. There's something in the wood that I couldn't see until I got it peeled down. Now notice something, I'm using the heel, I'm coming in, and rotating, and that's giving me that nice curve, that nice little cove-like curve. Okay, so I'm addressing the wood, holding the skew at about a 45 degree angle, and I want you to notice This was freshly uh, freshly sharpened. Do you see that it's dirty on the bottom third of the skew? That is where I'm cutting. I'm not cutting up here. I'm not cutting here. I'm cutting at the bottom third of the skew, okay? That is the safest place to use the blade. You want to cut below midpoint. Bottom third is best, okay? That's also going to get dull the fastest. So pay attention to how sharp your skew is. And we're going to go over sharpening the, the best, the easiest way while you're working to keep it sharp and keep it up, up to what you need to be. Okay? So this is almost round. I'm going to show you another cut. 
This is called the peeling cut. So you set your skew so that it's parallel with the grains. Hit the tool rest first. As the wood is spinning, you simply address the skew down to the wood and it will peel the wood. Tool rest first. Lift the handle. This is flat on the rest. That looks like pencil shavings, right? Same action. It's just like pencils, like a pencil sharpener, except you're just holding the blade rather than sticking your pencil inside where the blade is, which is another plane, okay? Same concept. Plane, blade. You're just holding the frame and this is your plane, okay? Exact same concept. Look, that's nice and round. Real good way, real fast way. If you need to say, Alex, turn the ends of the dowel to go on your bench, right? And it needs to be consistent. So that thickness right there is what I need it to be. I take about a quarter of an inch at a time. See these little shadows? Make them go away. When you take your caliper, your outside diameter caliper, and you measure, because you set the, de the width there, you maintain the width, the same width all the way up and down. Take it down to where you want it. Take the next pass to meet it. Take the next pass to meet it. Take the next pass to meet it. I have a nice straight cylinder. That's how, how it goes. Fairly quick and easy. Oh man, my mentor's calling me and I can't answer him. That's kind of a bummer. Oh, hopefully he'll call me tomorrow. Okay, so. I showed you the the, the uh, shaving cut and and the uh, the peeling cut. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get the rest of this round because I'm going to start. I'm going to show you planing, and then we're going to start cutting into, uh, and then we're going to start cutting doing uh, beads and coats. So let me get this sucker round. Remember, I'm not trying to come in from the end. Now you see things flying. When you're trying to take something from squared around and you're using essentially a straight knife blade, you're gonna flip splinters off. Okay, that's what's flying around. So another benefit of the peeling cut remember that made pencil shaving. So if you're scared of the flying splinters, just do peeling cut like this, and you get pencil shavings instead of flying splinters. Me, I'm used to getting hit with flying splinters, and I trust my equipment. So I know it's not going to damage me, so it doesn't scare me to make splinters fly. You do what you feel comfortable and safe with. You don't like the flying splinters, use the peeling cuts. Okay. Now this whole thing is round. I got a little flat edge here, but it doesn't matter. Because... I've got you on this end. <clears throat> Support your. We're gonna. We're about to talk about the planing cut. That's that's about about where I'm at now. Remember, when this was bigger, right? 
I had to have my tool rest higher. I'm still going to keep my tool rest above the center, but I have a smaller diameter to work with. So I need to lower my tool rest a little. I don't ever want to be cutting down like this. Okay, I want to be dropping onto the work surface, not cutting down into it. So I don't want my tool rest too high. It can get too high. I want it roughly a third of the way down on my workpiece. Also need to leave at least a half an inch of distance, maybe closer to an inch, depending on the operations you're doing. Okay. Every time you address the wood with the tool, the wood touches the tool rest first. Then you bring it down to the wood. If you touch the wood first, it's going to kick it straight back at you. And hopefully you have a good hand, hand hold on your tool because if you don't, it'll launch it. Tool rest, then lower down to your work. Tool rest, then lower down to your work. Remember, I'm teaching you about how to use the skew safely. Tool rest, then lower the tool down to your work, the cutting edge down to your work. Don't let it lever up. This never leaves the tool rest. I'm about to do a couple of cuts. I'm going to turn the skew, but this will never leave the tool rest, okay? It will always walk on the tool rest. As long as you keep your tool anchored on the rest, you're halfway there in a battle with the skew. Let's talk about the planing cut. Remember, toe, heel, plane. So the planing cut, I'm going to lay the plane of the skew. You see this side lifted up a little because this is the plane, not this. I'm going to lay the plane of the skew onto the wood, and I'm going to shave just like that hand plane. Okay, so I'm going to get the plane onto the wood so that the, the heel can address the wood, and we're going to shave a very fine uh, line. Don't start off the end, it won't work. Start close to the end, tool rest, lower, raise it up. And what I'm getting is very, very fine shavings. Now this wood is kiln dried, so I'm getting it's breaking up. If it was green, it wouldn't break up. But look at how fine these shavings are. This is thinner than a piece of paper. And this surface pretty much doesn't need to be sanded. This is different from the previous gut, the first one. I'm not sure I understand your question, Alex. Oh, different than the previous cut. Yes. Okay, so the previous cut, I brought the tool down, addressed it, brought the, brought the blade up to almost a 45 degree angle. Okay, so what I'm doing is just taking a peel. I'm just removing a bulk of material. Okay, let me show you. So, tool rest, bring the tool to about a 45 degree angle, and I'm really kind of digging that peel in, okay? But what I'm doing is removing a large bulk of material. I'm hogging the material off. The plane, I'm going to bring it in. I'm going to let this plane rest against the wood and bring it so that the blade just touches it. Now I am planing. Now I am making a very, very fine, very smooth cut. And here, let me unplug the fan. Now, this was over here was where I did the just the 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 peeling cut, just getting getting it off. Okay, here's where the planing cut is. Listen. Hear how rough that is. Hear how much smoother that is. Okay. So here, although I have a very nice finish and I could sand it easily, here it's like it's already glassy. I really don't have to touch it with much more than maybe 320 or 400 grit sandpaper and just boop, 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 okay? 
The hall pass is at the chalkboard. All right, so th there is a difference, okay? Um, yeah, I know, it's hotter than it could be. It's 80 degrees and 100% humidity out here, so I'm plugging a fan back in. But I wanted you to hear, you can actually hear that this is a rougher cut than this. That's why I did that. So if you look, here I was getting, I was I was at the end of my pass and my, I, my hands were turning a little, so it dug in. I don't know if you can, I don't know if I can show you that. There's a little tiny bit of tear out there. So right here, there's tear out, okay? And that's because I was I was turning the blade as I'm planing. My pass got to the end. My hands naturally turned. So the blade went like that, and it started digging again like that big, big clearing cut, that peeling cut, rather than planing. You have to keep this surface at the constant angle in order to plane. Okay, so that's just something to note. This takes practice. This takes a lot of practice. You are going to make a lot of toothpicks if you want to learn to use the skew. Don't shy away from that. Make toothpicks. Make toothpicks. All right, let's get this back down to this all back down to round so that uh, we can start some different cuts. Now, in order to get here, I have to switch hands. Once I get rid of that little lip, I go back to my dominant hand. You can actually hear when the angle of the attack changes and it starts digging in. And if you were paying attention, see this little weird little groove? I don't know. Let's see if I can show you this little groove here. See that little weird divot? Do you want to know why there's a divot there? It corresponds directly with this little dent in my tool rest. That's how fine that shave is. This little bump here translated directly into the wood. So the way you fix that is you take a... Uh, uh, hate my brain. What's that? A rasp. And dress your tool rest. Get those nicks out. Make sure that you try to keep a level surface. But get those little nicks out because when you're working on the wood using the skew, your skew, even though the tool rest is up, your skew is always going to be addressing the tool rest at a slight upward angle. So this little nick right there, you can hear it, translates directly to the wood if I hit it, which it did. Okay, something to notice. If you're trying to do really fine work like finial work, pay attention to your tool rest and where your tool rest is. So that's planing and peeling. We have a nice clean surface that almost doesn't need to be sanded. Literally touch it with some 240, 320, and be done. Um, but now let's start talking about beads and copes. 
and V cuts and all these fun shapes you can get with a skew. Again, you can keep your tool rest slightly above the center because if you hit the center with the skew, you've gone through the wood, okay? So first, we're gonna do a V-cut. Just put the point in using the toe or the long end. Get the point in, then pull it back, come out. See that kick back? Okay, we're going to make a little knot from side to side. You have to do this confidently. If you hesitate, it kicks. You do it slow, but you can't do it too slow or you'll kick. You'll get a catch. Okay, so there's a V-cut using the sharp point of the toe of the tool. Now, very little bit at a time, using the toe till the sharp point, you can cove that out. Now notice what I'm doing is taking very fine, very light cuts. After you've been doing it for 30 or 40 years, like a lot of these British guys, you could just whip in there. Until you get to that point, don't try to be that point. Take your time. Be very gentle, or you get catches, okay? Take your time. Now I'm showing you this to show you you can do it. However, those British guys that have been doing it for a million years, and they're experts, and they can whip it out and just wow everybody, also figured out that that's what this tool is really good for. And when you've got 13 apprentices working for you and you've got to get them making coves on chair legs really fast, you give them the tool that they can do it faster with. Now, I'm purposely banging those wings into the piece to show you why you don't hollow with this sucker. So, for coves, you use the toe, Alex. For coves, you want the long toe in there. You take small bites, a little bit at a time, and you roll it out. But you have to be careful that you don't kick it over, because then you'll get a uh, you'll get a uh, catch. Okay. Let's make some beads. Now beads, counterintuitively, you use the heel. So to do a bead, first I'm just going straight in. Then I turn it around. And again, still get kicks, still get a catch. Try to do it too fast. And you haven't been doing it for 30 years, because I have not, and you get catches. So what do you do when you get catches? Fix it. Maybe put a little cove on the other side of that bead. So what do I need? A bead cut. That's using the toe. 
the long edge. Toe, come over, bring down the bead, and all I'm doing is just rolling my tool to vertical. Like I said, I'm not an expert. I'm showing you how you can start learning to do this safely. Okay, you can't do a cove with the toe with the heel. You've got to turn it around, bring that toe in there, that sharp toe, and very slightly whittle it out. Okay, so let's fix the other side of his bead. Round it off a little bit. There we go. Let's make this a bead. As I rotate the tool, I also lift the handle which moves the cutting part of the tool closer towards the center of the wood. So you can't just roll it because I, I lose connection, right? As I start going downhill, I lose connection. I've also got to lift the handle. The coordinated movement. I'm just cleaning that down a little bit. Okay. V-cut. Toe. Now to cut your cove, you lift, you rotate the toe of the tool towards the depth, deep part of the cove, and you turn your tool out. Okay, but I want this to be beaded. So I turn back to the heel, rotate the tool, lift the handle, Like I said, I'm not an expert. I'm still practicing. You practice, you practice, you practice, you practice. But what we've got to get away from is being scared of it. This is a tool that is available to us that is very useful. That when you learn to control it, can do a lot. But it's starting to get dull. You can see where I'm cutting. See? bottom third of the tool, but it's starting to get dull. So, if you have a sharpening system, you can go over to your sharpening, sharpening system every time. And you can, you can go through all that, but you don't have to. The cool thing about this is this is literally a knife. This is the same as your kitchen knife, okay? This is a, literally a knife. So, this, is a 400 grit diamond card. When it starts getting dull, pay close attention. Look at what you're doing. Make sure you're flat on the plane. Just take about five or six passes. Flip it over. Same thing, keep it flat on the plane. All you're doing is honing it. And the dirty little secret that all those British furniture makers don't want anyone to know is after they hone it, they take a piece of denim or a piece of leather, denim, and they strop it just like a straight razor. And that makes this piece, this blade, Sharp again, razor sharp. Okay, 
It's that simple. Use the diamond hone and then you can strop it. Just like that. Drag it over denim. Yeah, you could yes, you absolutely you can do that. You can do that for your regular woodworking chisels once it's sharp and you just need to put get it back to to, to razor, you can do that. Um, something else you can do most of the time when I'm turning and I'm trying to crank out a lot and I'm using my spindle roughing gouge. You can do the exact same thing. This is at a 45 degree angle. You pay close attention. Make sure you keep your 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 hone exactly even with the plane. This is the plane. There's the blade. This is the heel. This is the toe. You just take a couple quick passes. Make sure you stay flat on there. But you do the same thing. Take a couple quick passes. Now see that those British spindle turners that are making 100 chairs a day figured this out because if they did it this way, they didn't have to stop everything, turn off their lathe, go across the shop to the one sharpening wheel. They kept a hone in their pocket and they wore leather or denim aprons and they honed it and stropped it. And it works. It's the exact same principle as a razor. Oh, that's another thing. When you buy from certain brands, Savannah and Hurricane, this is cut at a 45 degree angle. This has shaped at 15 degrees on each side or a 30 degrees. So it goes from 90 to 30 reshape your chisels and get that 15 degree angle on the plane so that you have a 30 degree cutting blade it is much better and much sharper don't keep it at 45 it will work it will cut you can use it exactly the same way i'm showing you but the 30 degree sharp angle is much much better and gives you more, more control and a finer cut all right uh parting off that was the one thing that the person who I was watching, Stout Creations, I'm not trying to call you out, but I want to show you this, um, was turning a honey dipper and wasn't sure how to part off the end. And so had it in a chuck. You notice this is between centers, not a chuck, but they had a piece in the chuck. So the chuck held it so that they could use a... a, a uh, <coughs> gouge to clean up the end instead of parting it straight we're going to we're going to part this off okay so this is between centers and i'm just going to take apart and part right here so again i'm just a little bit above center don't have to be a lot above center and i'm going to start this is a quarter of an inch wide so i need to give myself room so i'm going to start by making a V-cut so that I have room to fit my chisel. All I'm doing, blade hits the tool rest, blade addresses the wood, rotate the handle, just lift the handle. Okay, just lift the handle. You can see I'm close to the edge and I snap some off. Peel that down. Okay. If you want to cut it, part it off straight, you come in a V out here, give yourself room. This little edge, you want straight, and you just cut it straight down, and rotate the tool handle up as you push the tool in towards the middle, and you get a nice straight cut. Come back, cut a V, give yourself room. Come back, and it parts. Now that's what everybody's scared of. I got a catch, and it launched my piece, right? But where did it push the piece? I'm fine. The piece went away from me. So I am perfectly safe. It never came near me. Everybody's scared of that. Why? It went away. It's always going to go away if you have your tool anchored. That wood is spinning around into your tool. So when it catches like that, because the end of the wood split, it pushed it away. That was actually safe. 
That's the safe way to do it. It's not going to hurt me. And I can show you exactly what happened. The live center pushed in here, cracked the wood. That crack got loose as I got closer and closer, right? And it snapped it. It caught and launched it. Pete launched it away. Yes, the lathe can spin in the other direction, but the tool can't cut in that direction. Okay, I've got the lathe spinning towards me with the blade facing the wood. If I spin it away, I just make dark lines. And not all lathes do reverse. This lathe happens to reverse. Not all lathes do. All right, so when this happens, and I can't hold it, I can't hold it here again, right? So I got to go back to the drawing board real quick. Alex's favorite tool. Lop the end off. You can walk over to your chop saw, chop it off, however you want. Take the end off. Brush yourself off. Change your underwear if you need to. I fully expected that to happen, so it didn't scare me. Now, I still have my center here, okay? I still have my center here. So I'll put it back on the drive end. Now, I've lost an inch of length, so I'm going to come back in. Now, you can take your time and try and measure it. We don't have time for, to sit here watching me fumble, so I'm just going to eyeball it. And it's okay if it's not exactly centered, because guess what? I happen to have it on a lathe, and I can make it round again. I keep splitting the distance. Close enough. It's a little bit off, but we'll fix it in about two seconds flat. Peel and cut. Tool rest. We're back to round, okay? We're back to round. Now, bowl turners. I'm about to blow your mind. <clears throat> Remember how we ride the bevel? What's that? All the principles of the bowl gouge came from this tool. Take your bowl, take your take your uh, skew, and bend it, and wrap it around a tube, and what do you have? A bowl gouge. Okay. Same principles. Riding the bevel. Right. That's the plane. Exact same principle. That's the plane. That's the plane. That's the plane. This is the toe. The wings are the heels. It's got two heels and a toe. You're pushing the sharp end of the toe into the wood, leaning on the plane, and cutting. Just a thought. That's why you shouldn't be scared of the skew if you're a bowl turner. Your, your bowl gouge is a skew. It's just... A warped one. Okay. So, parting off again. Make yourself room. Make a V. Let me move you so you can see this, because this is a... Uh... Okay, so what I'm doing is I've got 
this edge straight perpendicular to the center line of the piece. I'm riding that V down, lifting the handle, coming back, cutting the V so I have room, right? And I'm coming straight in. All right? So I'm going to come back, widen my V. Now, if you feel like you've got too much of this, too much of this rubbing out here, shave it down a little. You're getting rid of this end anyway, right? Are you getting too much friction? Shave it down. Now here, all I'm doing, very gently, there it is. That's how you can part the end, and uh, make sure you turn your lathe off. Then you have a tiny little bit to sand. Well, let me move it. Then you have a tiny little bit to sand, or you can just, after all, you're holding a razor in your hand, right? Look at that. Nice and clean. Okay? Nice and clean, quick and easy. So, yeah, you don't need to see my arm hair. Come on. I have sawdust on my hands. <laughs> it doesn't want to recognize my phone. All right, so again, I took off another inch. So what can I do with this skew? Well, all kinds of great things spindle turning. Well, the sky's the limit. Figure it out. You're a wood turner. Figure it out. What can I do? I'm about to make the historic witch's magical wand. Guess what? It wasn't a magical wand. It's actually a Scottish kitchen tool called a spurtle. And it's used to do things like stir porridge. So we're going to use a skew and make a spurtle or a wand Whichever you wish, but I'm going to go with the historic, which is the spurtle. Don't know what it is? Look it up. S-P-I-R-T-L-E. So again, I'm not quite on center. Not a big deal. We're around now. Another thing, when you're using a skew chisel, you've heard me say this before, cut downhill. Go from wider to more narrow. Cut downhill. If you try to cut uphill, hear it? It splinters and it catches, okay? It splinters and it catches, and this is torn to crap. This looks horrible. Cut downhill from wider to more narrow. So this is going to be the handle of my spurtle over here. This is going to be the tip. One of the things I like about the skew is I am very, very, very right-handed. In fact, it's almost disabling how dominantly right-handed I am. Using the skew chisel forces me to train my left hand to do precise movements, maintain control, and move where I go it. So it actually makes me a better turner because 
I am training myself to be ambidextrous. So these are plain cuts using the toe or the short end of the skew, bottom third of the blade. Because this is the end that you're going to use to stir the pot. This is going to be the narrow end. But you'll notice, even though I'm using the heel, on that end, I still get a cove. Now, fiddle rough and gouge. Don't come in it straight at. You can still start from a little bit above the center of the workpiece, but I have to lower myself a little because it's getting narrower. Don't come at it like this. You can. You can do this. Okay? But that's the same cut. That's the same cut as this. Okay? And I'm, I'm bugging it up on purpose to, to, to so show you that it's rough. If you tip it up, ride the plane or the bevel, actually getting a planing cut. I'm using the bottom third part of my blade. It's a skew just bent. Yeah, the tenon dovetail tool, right? <laughs> it's a skew just bent. It's the same tool. Same principles. Narrower plane, toe, heel. And these are, these little wings also are like the, the, uh, heel the points okay but I'm getting the exact same effect and the same fineness of finish I can get a tiny bit more refined finish with the plane than I can with the spindle roughing gouge but it's exactly the same principle and it works exactly the same this one's just curved but it's the same thing okay so, and I've been using my one inch plane. If you really want to get finicky, put less blade space on there. I could do much finer work with a half inch plane because I don't have three quarters uh, or uh, two thirds of an inch waving around. I've got uh, whatever two thirds of a half of an inch is, right? I'm not, do I'm not good at math, I'm a wood turner. Same thing though, same thing, tool rest, Address the wood, lower the blade down, flaming cut.
Now, I want you to notice something. If I hold the straight bar of my tool up and compare it to this piece, you'll notice it gets narrow and wide and narrow and wide. Because I'm using a narrower cutting edge, a narrower blade, so I have less plane steadying my blade and holding my cut straight. So this takes a lot more control over long distances to use the narrower skew. Okay, takes a lot more control. If you're shaky, if you really need to spend 20 minutes and really refine the edge of your tool rest, okay, you're not gonna get that. Okay, I really need to refine my tool rest. I've got a lot of nicks and bumps in here from getting catches with a skew that bangs that sharp edge that the steel is harder than the steel of the tool rest, right? So I'm getting those bumps translated. So I'm going to get a smoother, straighter cut using the wider plane. Not that I can't do it with this, but I'm fighting an uphill battle because this isn't even. So use the tool that's right for what you're doing. Now, when I get to the fine work up here on the handle, I'll use the shorter skew because I don't have to fight with... Uh, with the shorter skew, I don't have to fight with all this hanging out there, and it's thinner. So again, plane and cut, tool rest first, rust the wood, rotate the blade until it's cutting. That divot I just put in there just showed up. Ready for my magic trick? It cuts backwards too. Why? The wood's moving, not the knife. Do you hear that? Listen. You might be able to see it. I've got vibrations going on. Why do I have vibration going on? I've gotten to the point now where this piece of wood is so thin that it, even though I'm using a planing cut and supporting it with the bevel, Can you see the little ridges? Uh, where am I? Can you see the little ridges? See those little ridges? This is now at this point where it's gotten so thin that, it, that cutting it is making it vibrate and I'm getting little tiny divots where the blade's going in and out and in and out because it's vibrating. Now here's a cool thing about using a skew when you get real thin. And I never do this left-handed, so I might screw this up because I am very right-handed. Get your tool down in position and hook a finger over the back side to steady your, your piece. 
So your finger helps to absorb the vibration. Now again, I do that right-handed. I am very, very right-handed. I am not good with my left hand. Another way to deal with that, still using the same trick, but it's easier to control, spindle roughing gouge. Get it in, get it started, get a finger on the back side. Just keep a nice, easy, clean cut. Make sure you can keep that spindle tip, that uh, gouge tipped up. That's where you're going to get your clean cut. Now, why doesn't that get hot and hurt? Because I'm using a planing cut and I'm making this very, very smooth. Okay, I'm making this very, very smooth. So basically what I'm doing, plane of the tool, the plane here rests against the wood. I roll it in till it just starts to shave. And then I make a bridge with my thumb and my finger, pull back towards the tool gently with my finger and steady my cut. Just like that. Yeah, you, now the other thing you can do is go to about two, uh, probably 220 grit sandpaper and take, take a couple passes with your sandpaper and it'll do the same thing. If you don't have time or if you're, you know, uh, this, is, this is a technique that, like I said, those, those British uh, spindle turners that have been doing it for 473 years, this is how they do it. Um, you don't have to do it that way. You can absolutely hit it with sandpaper. Do what you feel is safe. Just because you saw me do it doesn't mean that's the way you have to do it. Do what you feel is safe. All right, so here's the stirring end of my spurtle, okay? We're going to get to this end and make the handle. Again, this is where witches' wands came from. They actually were, it's a Scottish cooking tool used to stir your uh, porridge. We're gonna go back to the uh, back to the skew, and you'll, we'll use the skinny skew. So I'm just doing peel and cut, get it back to round because remember we moved the end a couple of times, so this end isn't round. It also needs to be a lot narrower because hey, it's, it's a handle for a cooking tool. It's not a not a baseball bat. So just like pencil shaving, is what I'm getting off of here with this peeling cut. Now, my drive spur is here at this end. So I want to leave a buffer between my drive spur and the end of my piece. I'm just going to cut myself a V. And I'm going to stay on the inboard side of that V. And I will never hit my drive spur and break my tool. All right, so let's make this little sucker fancy. I'm gonna end up making a bead on this end uh, before I part it. So I'm gonna keep that in mind. This needs to be narrower. But I think I want a bead here. So again, using the heel or the short end, roll it in. Rotating the tool and lifting the back end. Rotate the tool, lift the back end. Okay, so I've got a nice little bead, a nice little half of an OG shape here. Sort of, kind of, but not really, but sure, it works. This is a cove, so I'm using the toe. I'm going to clean that cove up. And if I'm not happy with it, and I don't think I'm getting a good cut, 
Then I go back to the spindle gouge that is really just a shorter version of the roughy gouge. Not really a good example of the spindle gouge, but it works for this application. I use it the same way I use the roughing gouge. Turn it up on its side, plane of the cut of the gouge against the wood, and just gently shave away a little bit and get my curve there. And blend that in. Riding the bevel, the exact same thing as keeping the plane of the uh, plane, the foot of the plane on the piece of wood. All right, again, this is a handle. It's a kitchen handle for stirring food. So I don't want to get too ornate and make it bumpy and crazy and hard to hang on to. That's not what the purpose of the tool was for when they were originally used. So I think what I'm going to do, starting with a B, so I'm going to make myself a little coat. myself a little more delineation here. The one thing to remember when you're using a skew chisel, especially on fine detail work, is leave yourself work room for the width of the of the chisel. You always have to clean back away from your Start line point, points. Now, I will tell you, I am personally not there yet with the, with the skew where I can get the shape that I have in my head for this handle correctly. So I'm going to use the spindle gouge. And actually, because I am, I started turning bowls, I'm, I'm even better with the bowl gouge, but I have to lower the tool rest, different tool. Use the tool that suits your ability best, but don't be afraid of the skew. Learn the fundamentals and use it where you can as you build those fundamental skills. get back to where I'm doing details, I can go back to my little skew. Come here, using the, the heel, the short end of the skew, plain and cut. Stop being so aggressive, Mr. Left Hand. Always cutting downhill for a fine edge, a finished cut. And 
I have a V on this side. We're going to do half of a bead on this side. Bring my V back down. I'm getting a little bit of a catch there. <clears throat> so, I'm very carefully bring that V in, back that off. This is probably still a little too wide, so we'll plane it down a little bit more. Nice, light passes. The worst thing you can do is white knuckle askew. You don't want to have a, such a, a strong grip on it. You want to keep your passes nice and light, keep your fingers loose. So our vibration marks here. Stay very, very gentle, very slight. Yeah, I'm actually taking those out because I'm barely pushing. Now here I'm using the heel, not the toe. The toe is more aggressive and I'm trying to be as gentle and light as possible. But I also have to cut downhill. Okay, and again, if you're not happy with it, or if it's not round enough, or if you want to change the shape, or if you have this little ridge in the middle that you just don't like, Very gently, nice and smooth. And I have a little bit of that. See where my catch was? I don't know if you can see it or not, but I have a I have a gouge right here where I got a catch. So I'm going to clean that up with the spindle gouge. That's not really a spindle gouge. More of a short roughing gouge. Cutting downhill. Nice and smooth. Okay, now finishing this tool. My drive center's here. I've got this wide hip. I've got to get in there and part this. But on the other end, I've got the narrow point I want to put a ball on, and that point is actually driving into the wood. So I've got to lose at least a quarter inch of that wood. What do I do? I can get this thinness here, which is about a little more than a quarter of an inch, let's say three-eighths of an inch, I can get close to that here safely before 
it becomes so weak that this will break before I get this taken care of. And then I part this end off and I use a saw or the sander to get, clean this end. So that's what we're going to do is we're going to take the skew in, we're going to do V cuts and get this narrow, more narrow so that we don't end up having to cut too much. Or we can use a parting tool. Okay, because this end, the skinny end, is the one we actually want to part off the lathe. Okay, so for this, because I'm going into a deep cut, in order to have most support possible, I'm going to use the wide skew. And I'm going to use the toe because my point is to get down in and cut. I'm doing a V on this side. And then I want to continue my nice little curve here that I'm rolling. So it's the exact same. And I can use the heel because this is a bead. This is the outside edge of a bead. Rotate it inward. Lift the end of the tool up. Come down and meet my V. Now I'm about a half inch thick there and I'm a quarter there. I'm going to call it, after I fix this little bump, I'm going to change the shape just a hair. Make it more comfortable for the ball of your hand. And again, I'm just rotating it down, lifting the heel, of the, lifting the handle, and bringing that cutting edge down in. So, this is basically where I want it. This is basically what I want. Now, no matter how fine your tooling is, because this is very thin, okay, I still have these ridges. Because of the vibration, just the fact that I'm dragging a blade across wood, I still have these ridges. This is why you always sand, okay? This is why you always sand. So we're going to hit it with the sandpaper real quick. And I'm going to show you when you use your tools right and you get clean, planing cuts when you're slicing the wood. I'm going to show you how fast it is to sand this. Hang on a minute. Now, in spindle orientation, with spindle turning, you can keep the lathe moving pretty fast. When you are sanding a bowl, you need to be around 500 max speed. When you're sanding a spindle, you can go a lot faster. I'm going to start with 240 grit. Second, second strip, 240 grit. I'm going to get into all my little nooks and crannies. I'm still spinning at 1800 RPM. And remember, the people who develop these techniques are cranking out 100 chairs a day in a factory that's steam powered in, you know, the lower east side of Liverpool, England. And uh, the fact that their family eats that night depends on how many spindles they turn. So, sand it this direction, reverse the lathe. It's okay if you don't have a reversing lathe. This just makes it easier and faster to sand it. Do the exact same thing. Get all your little nooks and crannies. And no, I'm not wearing my respirator, and I should be, so that you can hear me while I do the demonstration. I will risk it for this short period of time. Thank you, safety police. Okay, then just go up and down, and I still have a little bit of that vibration groove in there, so we'll work this area a little closer, still with 240 grit, gone.
We'll come up and down this way, and that gets rid of any circle, circles that are uh, perpendicular to the plane of the wood. And I still have some little vibration bumps there. So we'll just work that a little more specifically. That's gone. Okay. Like I said, we'll run this way. Take out any of those sanding lines with the grain. If you run with the grain, if you have a scratch, nobody notices. Now, because this is a kitchen tool, I am going to finish it using food safe uh, materials. I'm going to use the Axe Abrasive Paste and the Axe uh, Polishing and Restoring Wax. But I think I'm going to burn that first. <clears throat> the British guys back in the olden days used wires. Wires, you can use wires, but they're very dangerous. You can use a little uh, uh, countertop sample card, or you can just use a piece of wood. This is safer because if it gets caught, it just drops. If it's a wire and it gets caught, it wraps and starts whipping. Me, no, I do not have a foot pedal lathe. That would be cool. <laughs> Friction burn. We may have to revisit that because the sanding paste is going to take a lot of it off. Let's see who's blowing me up. Yes, I will upload this to YouTube. Okay, so both the Axe and the Brad's Workbench products that I use are food safe. I'm just using the Axe because I have more of it and it's less expensive. Nothing against Brad's. It's fantastic. It's also food safe. This is just, I have more of this. Now for this, I'm going to slow the lathe down. I don't get any endorsements from either Brad's Workbench or Axe. These are the products I use. Uh, those British guys use Yorkshire Grit, which is literally grit from the factory dust of the city of Yorkshire in a uh, medium, a wax medium. I can't tell you whether or not Yorkshire Grit is food safe. I don't know, I've never used it. It's a fine product been used for hundreds of years but I don't know I don't know anything about it so I'm running about 550 rpm right now I'm just working that that uh, abrasive paste in then I'm gonna fold my towel to a cleaner spot I'm gonna kick it up to about 750 rpm now is when I start working it out so it's abrading it's sanding it's making this smoother and when you're done using this particular po uh, paste, uh, you have done the equivalent of sanding to 1,000 grit. I'm going to kick it up to about 1,100 RPM. Abrasive pastes, if you want a good shiny finish, are a really, really useful tool. Okay. Each pass, my paper towel gets cleaner. I'm almost done. I'm going to kick it up to about 1,200 RPM. Make sure I work into my grooves and get all the paste out of those grooves. Just about there. One more pass. Nice and clean. Fresh paper towel. This is simply beeswax, carnauba wax, and mineral oil in whatever proportions uh, Tom over at Axe has, has developed. And that's the trade secret is how much of each he puts in there. But it's all food uh, grade. It's all perfectly safe. 
Mineral oil is what they use to finish your cutting boards. Uh, carnauba wax is actually sprayed on your apples to make them look shiny. And of course, beeswax. Uh, so again, this is all food grade. Food safe, you can stir a pot of porridge with this spurtle. And do you, does everybody understand why this is where magic wands came from? Who? Yeah, Axe, I'm, this is the polish paste right here. And I use both the Brad's too. Brad's is also food safe. But like I said, it's more expensive and I have less of it. Nothing against Tom's Axe. It's great stuff. I love it. I just have more of it. All right, the carnauba wax has to melt to 180 degrees. It's very, very hard. So you want your RPM up there at least 1200 because this is a friction polish. What you're doing is heating that wax up so that it starts to penetrate the wood and work into the wood. If it's not hot so that you're going, I'm done, ouch, I'm done, then you're not doing it enough. So you might want to take a little bit off and flip the paper towel so that you get more of a buffing action. You get a little bit more friction. Make sure we get in there. All our little creases and... Thankfully, the axe didn't take my burn away. That's really cool. I'm glad it didn't. So I don't have to mess with that anymore. Okay. Now, why am I using a paper towel instead of a rag? Because if I use a paper towel and it gets caught, which I can't make it do because this is too smooth, the paper towel tears. Where the rag wraps, flaps, can catch your finger, and deglove you, which means peel the skin off your finger. So that's why we use paper towels. They used to use rags back in the day, and there are wood turners walking around missing fingers. Okay, so remember I said we're going to make a bead on this end to part it. This is about three-eighths of an inch. Here, I'm just under half an inch. I want to make this a little closer to this so that I have less to saw. There are a couple ways I can do that. Because I really didn't leave myself enough back area here, I'm going to use my narrow parting tool simply because if I try to use the gouge I'm, or the skew, I am going to end up hitting my drive center. Oh, good point, and I missed it, and bad on me. You're so right. What you're talking about, who is that? PM blocker. You're exactly right. What you're talking about is burnishing. Before I put the wax on, I should have burnished it. That is another old trick from the old country, from the old English guys. What it is, and I should have done it. You're absolutely right. In, in my bad, I missed a step. You get a handful of shavings. You can do this on your bowls too, by the way. It makes a great finish. Get a handful of shavings. Kick your lathe up all the way to high speed. Get them in there and put pressure on, okay? And the friction gives a burnish on the wood which really really accentuates your shine it really really accentuates your shine okay i don't understand what's going on there all right so i should have burnished this you're absolutely right and i didn't and that's on me i forgot the step that is the that is an old english furniture making trick it is a, it's a technique I use on all my bowls, so why I forgot to do it here, I don't know. So first we're gonna thin this out with a thin parting tool, get it closer, but not all the way. Okay, we're gonna get it closer, but not all the way. Then we're going to make our little bead on the end here. I want this rounded because it's a stirring tool to go into a pot, so. I'm going to use my narrow parting tool because I didn't leave myself enough space. That's my bad. Now, I made this tool out of an uh, old blade from a uh, sawzall. Okay. 
So I'm going to get down to about three eighths of an inch, the same as I am on that end, and I'm stopping. Because I still need to drive so that I can finish my tip. All right, now here I want a bead. So I'm going back to the skew. Heel. Remember the tip, the point, the point of my tail center is driving in about a quarter of an inch. So I'm going to back up from that. Roll and lift. Roll and lift. Roll and lift. Up. Oh, got a catch. Made a groove. Little scratch right there. What do I do? Clean it down. Don't get discouraged. Clean it down. Not the end of the world. Back to our 240 grit sandpaper. That literally gives me the opportunity to demonstrate burnishing. Handful of shavings, lathe at high speed, turning the correct direction towards you. Just get it in there and squeeze. Get pressure, you want heat. This is a, this is a friction. You see that little bit of a glow? That's burnishing. Give it a touch of the pastes. See, when you screw up with your skew, you can clean it up. You can fix it. It's not the end of the world. Usually, a little tiny catch like that is a little tiny catch. So you're not going to end up removing half of the material to fix it. I really don't need very much of this because I just am doing the end here. Slow it back down. Work it in. And this little space three passes I've used up the sanding paste and that's as glassy as the rest of it a little bit of the polishing paste really doesn't take a whole lot but again this is food safe Perfectly safe. I just licked it off my finger. It's not going to hurt me. It doesn't taste like much. It's just wax. But it's perfectly safe. Kick my speed up. I'm running about 1,490 RPM so that I can get some temperature, some heat, because this is a friction polish. Work it in. Okay, we fixed the we fixed the catch. Get my tool rest back. Let's part this puppy off. Again, this is the rounded tip of a kick cooking implement, so I want this part to be as smooth as possible. Heels doing me get injustice. I'll go in with the toe. Okay. If at this point you don't feel safe, use a saw. Okay? If at this point you don't feel safe, don't do what I'm doing. I've practiced this. I sit and do skew stuff just to keep myself fresh. I, I've trained myself to do this. If you don't feel comfortable doing it, use a saw and sand. Now 
Uh, you can't really see that in, but it's pretty, pretty clean. I literally, to finish this end, just do this. Then I get a little piece of paste on the on paper towel, spin it, a little bit of the wax, do the same thing, spin it, okay? And uh, hang on, I'll try to tighten this. Voila! A wand, or what it really was in the original, a spurtle. Now I still have this little bit, right? This is a traditional Scottish porridge stirring tool. It's a kitchen tool. Go back to my little pole saw. Alex's favorite tools. Same thing with the sandpaper. Takes less than 30 seconds. But having this little end bare, I can uh, put my initials in it or if I want, or say it's for somebody special, put their initials in it. Uh, if you had a little tiny version of a brand for, of your of your uh, logo, you could do that. There you go. This is where wands came from. This is this is the original witch's wand. It was actually a porridge making tool called a spurtle. So you get these, there's some, there's several people who make wands on TikTok and it makes some very intricate, amazing things. And it's wand talk and it's so cool and they don't realize that this came from the legend from Scotland from from women making porridge. So that's cherry wood. Uh, I will finish the ends, get it all finished up, and that will go. Uh, uh, we'll probably do a giveaway. We'll give that away. Um, uh, Pay attention. I'll, I'll put something up tomorrow about how to how to enter for the giveaway. So that's the skew chisel. Um, I tried to show you different ways to make it less scary, techniques to use. Uh, once again, I want to urge you: go to YouTube, look up "Worth the Effort: Demystifying the Skew." That is an outstanding video. It's about an hour long, and it's worth the time. Uh, check out Sam Angelo, the Wyoming wood turner. He does several videos on the skew chisel. Mike Walt, W-A-L-D-T, is a British turner who's been doing it for 500 years. Check him out on YouTube. Um, there's another one, and it's a big name, so of course I'm blocking him, and he's world-renowned for his skew lessons. But if you just go search YouTube for skew chisel, you will learn uh, a lot. Now, would I use oak? Absolutely not. Oak is, a, is an open grain for the same reason you don't use oak for cutting boards. Yeah, use ca Capnetti. Yeah, Capnetti, uh, Mike Walt, Sam Angelo, the Wyoming wood turner, worth the effort woodworking. Um, these are all great. Uh, these are all great resources. Um, you're welcome, Alex. Thanks for joining. Um, and of course I'm Alan Batty, Alan Batty, B-A-T-T-Y, Alan Batty. If you want to learn about the skew chisel, go watch Alan Batty on YouTube. He's incredible. This man can write your name in cursive on a spindle with a skew. I swear to God, he's amazing. Alan Batty on YouTube. Go watch him. Watch him. Watch him again, watch him three more times, then go back and watch him some more. If you want to learn how to use a skew, I, I cannot recommend highly enough, watch Alan Batty. Um, if anybody needs help, if you're worried, if you have questions about safety, please reach out to me. I'm on the YT, the YouTubes. I'm on the Instagram. I'm here. I'm on Faceplace. No. Let me tell you about Ashley Harwood. 
Ashley Harwood, who is a proponent of the 4040 skin spindle gouge or, or, or a bowl gouge. This is what Ashley Harwood, I saw her, it's on video. She went, so I sharpened my pencil and this is the only thing I use my skew for. And she wrote off almost uh, centuries of woodworking with a very powerful and useful tool. As great of a wood turner as she is, the fact that she has nothing for disdain for a skew, nothing but disdain for a skew, pisses me off. There's no need that she just basically discounted centuries of hard work and uh, the people who laid the foundations for the wood turning we know today. Ashley Hardwood, her opinion on skew chisels is garbage and it pisses me off because she's too good a wood turner to do that. It's a shame. If you want to learn more, don't just rely on me. I am not an expert. I'm sharing what I know. If you want to find experts, Wednesday nights, 7 p.m. Eastern, WorldWideWoodTurners.org. Go to WorldWideWoodTurners.org, and on Wednesday nights at 7, we have a meeting, a Zoom meeting. You click the Go to Meeting button. If you have Zoom, it opens up in Zoom. If you don't have Zoom, it opens up in a browser window. You don't have to have Zoom. And you can see Cap Maddie Castellan, uh, Dane... Um, Oh, dear goodness. There's names there. Uh, Kim Tippin, uh, 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 Pole Barn Productions, uh, he's there. Um, Billy Burt from the Messy Studio is there usually on Wednesdays. There is hundreds of years of experience at wood, WorldWideWoodTurners.org. It is your wood turning club. You do not have to pay money to join. Just show up and you're in. And they take all comers and they are... I've got to tell you, it's humbling. I wish I could physically sit in a room with that much experience and just be a sponge. Come to the meetings Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Eastern, WorldWideWoodTurners.org. You can find them on the face place. Mike Peace, yes, another excellent skew turner. Mike Peace, very good. But Alan Batty's, even Mike Peace will say, go watch Alan Batty. All right, any other questions, feel free to message me. You can email me. You can find me on Faceplace, Watai Wood Turning, uh, Instagram, Watai Wood Turning, my website, WatayWoodTurning.com. There's a link to email me there. Um, direct message me here. Um, thank you, PM Blocker. Uh, heck, if you know about my service dog page, my phone number's on that page. Text me so I know who you are and call me. And I'll try and help you out. That's all I got for tonight. It's late. I got a, uh, I got a uh, significant other in the house who's hurt and she messed up her knee. So I'm going to uh, sign off. Thank you all for joining me. This will be up in its entirety on my YouTube channel tomorrow morning. It's too late at night for me to mess with it tonight. But I'll get it up there tomorrow. Thank you all for joining me. Christine, thank you very much. Mama P, thanks for moderating for me. Good night, guys. <laughs>